Oh, how lovely. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Sean looks like he's at Art Center, but secretly he's in an undisclosed location somewhere in uh, the desert. So uh, yeah. now you know. Uh, we were just sitting here talking about how design needs a witness protection program, and one of us is going to start one. But before we do, let me introduce today's wonderful guest. Let me just say by way of introduction that we at Design Observer discovered sometime during the um, pandemic that uh, we missed not only seeing each other, but seeing each other's work, going to museums, going to conferences, um, and having a peek into the, the actual um, making that we all do every day. And so we've had a lot of fun with these kind of lunchtime show and tells, and we scheduled them in the middle of the day so that our friends can join from Europe and our friends can join from California, where Sean is. Uh, and of course, on the East Coast, it's lunchtime. So feel free to eat whatever meal is, is uh, appropriate for your zone. And uh, let me welcome our wonderful guest today. Sean Adams is the chair of design at Art Center in California. He's a graphic designer. He's a two-time past president of AIGA. And uh, he's a really wonderful book maker, designer, writer, uh, editorial design person. And his newest book, which is called How Design Makes You Think, and has a wonderful subtitle that I was going to um, ad lib, but I won't. I'll let Sean do it himself. Uh, is what he's primarily, I think, going to talk about today. And let me just say, without any further ado, that Betsy Bardell is going to wave. She's in the top left of your screen. She's our executive producer. Betsy's going to put in the chat right now a code where all of you can buy this book. Uh, Princeton Architectural Press has kindly agreed to give you all a 20% discount if you want to buy the book. And uh, if you needed more uh, encouragement to buy the book, Sean is about to give you some. So welcome, Sean Adams, at an undisclosed location in the desert despite the beautiful posters behind you. And thank you for taking an hour out of your busy day to spend with the rest of us. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, Jessica. And I mean, any, time, any chance to like hang out with you is, is of course, you know, I, I would talk about, you know, flint, like, um, you know, dust if you wanted me to. It's, it's How about it? <laughs> yeah, no, this, is a, this has been an amazing process. I, um, I think you were, you were actually in LA when, when I started it and, and the, for everyone who's ever read any of Jessica's books, if you're a writer, don't read them because you realize very quickly how bad of a writer you are in comparison. And I meet every, and it's amazing. Every time I, I read, I'm like, I got to go back and rewrite that book. I got to go back. I, I'm writing like a third grader. And Jessica's like, you know, got her PhD in, in literature. So, um, but yeah, you were in LA. And when, you know, I started thinking about this and, and I guess it came about because, you know, how many years, you know, have, have we been practicing where you go and meet with a client and you say, what's your, what's your issue? Okay. You figure out some attributes. You like, you know, design towards those attributes for the, the correct response. And it was like, I know how to do that, but I didn't know why I was doing that. And, you know, why I was making some of those choices. Um, like I knew how the audience would respond, but why? Like it just, so it was sort of dull as I felt like that's a really interesting thing. I, I wonder if I could dig into this and figure out like some of those issues. Um, and that was sort of the genesis of the idea of why or why are we doing, why do we design the way we do to get specific responses? And then, you know, did you, did how you does pitch it work? That, Did you pitch that idea to your publisher or did your publisher say, I've always wanted there to be a book about how design makes us think, Sean, what are you doing for the next few months? <laughs> I works? think I had I had finished and I finished the previous book. Um, which one was that? I can't remember. It was either dictionary type or um, graphic design rules. And um, we were just talking about you know different book ideas. Like what, what's that? What do you think? What do you think about it? And it, you know I'm always sort of I'm endlessly pitching this one concept that no one seems to want to do, which is a book about the unseen, which is people that you would never see published traditionally. Um, you know from communities that are not apparent um but everybody's like mm, uh, any other ideas and I, and love that. I love that idea what so because it's unseen you can't show anything in advance it's like it's like a sketch for an illustrator it's sort of, yeah it's sort of like look I know there's amazing stuff out there from like communities that we haven't seen before and it's going to be incredible and and then you just sort of get this like and what would that look like you know and would anyone buy that uh, you know um I, I mean I'm not going to give up on that one that's gonna that's sort of my next my next challenge 
is to, to get that to happen. Just because I know there's so much amazing stuff out there that is not in the mainstream that could be um, really interesting. And yeah, and um, he, he had mentioned, he said, you know, you, you, you get so close to you, you have all these reasons why, um, how to do things, but, but have you ever thought about why? And I'm like, oh my God, I never thought about that. And yeah, so that's sort of how it came about. For those of you who don't know Sean, there are many things to say about Sean, but I, I, I don't have a very disciplined mind and Sean does. And one of the uh, d uh, manifestations of Sean's extremely disciplined mind is that he's fastidious about the files he keeps. And as an editorial designer, I mean, I've been in his studio and, and just the way he logs work, the way he catalogs things, the fact that he can find everything, I'm the opposite of this. So I'm in awe of that. And I wonder if I could um, ask you to share your screen with us and maybe take us through a little bit of the, of the logic of this book, because I think visually from start to finish, it's really a fascinating journey. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me, let me do this here. Okay, let's start with this. Um, so, you know, it started out actually strangely enough, it started off with this DRAMS um, radio. When, you know, I'm like, yeah, it's such a gorgeous object. Everybody loves it. It sort of follows the Dieter Rams rules of design. Um, and that's great, you know. Um, but what, what is it saying to us? What's the actual communication? Well, the actual overt communication is I'm a radio, right? Like that's just pure and simple. Like I am nothing, I am a user-friendly radio. That's the message that I'm gonna get. And, you know, then looking at something like um, the Free Angela Davis Now poster, you know, which is going to elicit a different kind of response. Um, you know, I mean, first off, it's a magnificent poster, even though it was probably designed by non-designers. Um, you know, it's got that incredible high contrast. Um, you know, the composition is gorgeous. Um, and it's got this hard command, which you just can't, can't get around. But why? do we feel a sense of imperative? Like why, what is doing that? What is making us actually think this is important? And this is a serious subject that we have to look at. Um, and I found like a lot of times when you ask, ask designers about this, they, they would say, well, I don't know. That's just how you design. Um, you know, like one of the things that I really found was that designers are so amazing at being able to pull together form, image, um, material, color, words to create meaning. But often we do that so intuitively and so quickly that we're not even aware ourselves of like why we are making the choices that we're making. You know, that, that, uh, that ability to man manipulate form is a superpower that we just sort of take for granted. But why does it work the way it does? So for example, you know, I, I could look at something and say, you know, this, this amazing, you know, poster bike really type it's fun, it's happy, it's a little alternative, but why? You know, as opposed to, you know, the poster on the right, um, which is by me, which is clearly serious, modern. Um, this is not the sound of music, you know, but why? How are we getting that message? What are the visual cues that tell us that? So those are sort of the basic starting points of this. And, and so then, you know, the book ended up being really about that. It was understanding um, how we're seduced to interact or concentrate on one form rather than another, um, how we engage with beauty, and just the neurological and evolutionary reasons why we do those things. So the thing that was sort of interesting, and I'm not a neurologist, please don't ask me to do brain surgery on you because it'll go badly. Um, I found that the brain, the part of the brain that is involved with aesthetic judgment is actually, it's, um, it's, you know, medically within the medial orbital frontal cortex. And that's the area that's associated with the integration of all of our senses. It's also the place where we determine value and the expectations of results, and we do decision-making. So that's the area in our brain that monitors reward and pleasure. And that's sort of the, that's how we, that's how we deal with design as a whole and or aesthetic choices that we're making. So for example, you know, if you look at the idea of seduction, which, you know, is so critical, I mean, obviously, you know, like your, your first job as a designer is to seduce the viewer into the message, not to repulse them. You know, that typically doesn't work real well. If everyone's like, I'm repulsed, I'm not even gonna bother. But we have all these tricks under our, under our belt, right? So we use things like the golden rectangle. And 
And while this might seem, you know, to, to a lot of graphic designers, well, yeah, that's sort of obvious. I, I also wanted to make sure this book was written for like civilians, you know, that or for clients so that they would understand, oh, there is a purpose behind this. This isn't just like, like someone slapping together a bunch of stuff because it's a fun, um, wacky process, that there is meaning and there's, there's a reason why these things work. Um, and, and sort of deconstructing a little bit of, well, why do we like this? Why does this poster feel good? Um, you know, it's, you know, mathematical proportions and, and, and colors that work well together. Um, you know, one of the things that was really interesting to me um, was this idea of pleasure and reward in our minds and decision-making is a stressor, right? So if I have to make a decision, even the smallest decision, like what should I have for lunch, there's stress, right? You know, in your mind, you're like, good decision, bad decision. I don't know, well that, you know. So even choosing colors is about stress because if I have colors that are simple, bright, and easy to identify, I get it. I don't have to make a decision. That's blue, that's orange, I got it. As opposed to having colors that might be more complex like olive green, where I'm having to stop and think about it. Is that green or gray? What is that exactly? So just little things like that became interesting tools that talk to the idea of like why some work feels playful and sometimes juvenile and other work might be more sophisticated, you know, and it's that, that decision-making process. And Jessica, feel free to bump, bump, bump in anytime you want. Oh, you had me at the golden section. Keep going. <laughs> you know, I, I did so much research on this and, and obviously I've done it years before and I came across this one um, theory that um, 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 Adrian Bejan said um, at, at Duke and he said the reason we like the, the golden rectangle is because <clears throat> evolutionary wise we um, we evolved by scanning the, the landscape and so that horizontal frame is about the size we can see in our head like when we're looking but that's the form that we become the most comfortable with as we scan obviously scanning the landscape for like is there something to eat or something that's going to kill me you know um, like you know that sort of works. And the, the fun part was really tracking down examples that started to talk about things beyond just graphic design, you know, that <clears throat> it, 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 it felt a little <clears throat> flat, no pun intended, um, when I was just dealing with the graphic design part of it. So things like the telephone, like it occurred, it occurred to me like the sort of old school telephone, those things on the left page, they all work the same. You know, they've all got bells inside of them. They all have electrical components. They do the same job. <clears throat> but you can see the evolutionary evolution from, you know, the top magneto set, which was just basically giving the message, you can talk into me. Like, that's it. Like, you're not like, there's nothing there that's that, more than that. To the next, you know, the, the, um, the Western Electric one, which is basically, you can use me with two hands and talk into me, but I'm a machine. That's all there is to it. I'm not anything more than a, than a utility. Um, and you work your way down to the Henry Dreyfus models, the black and yellow ones, and they start getting more rounded, a little bit more accessible, um, a little friendlier um, to the yellow one, which is now you can put it in your house and it's not objectionable. It's not a giant industrial machine that you're, you're you know, plopping down in your living room. And then, you know, eventually working its way to the the kitchen telephone the on the wall phone that you know a lot of us grew up with with the extraordinarily long cord um for the speed to speak into it and then i love the the example of the princess telephone now and now keep in mind the princess telephone and the magneto set are exactly the same they on the inside you just take the parts of the part it, it all works exactly the same way but the princess telephone then is marketed towards young girls in the 1950s following what they, what at that time, what they assumed the gender roles were in terms of like, well, young ladies will love these light colors. Um, so it's entirely designed as a, as, a, as a consumer object to fit in a nice pink bedroom, you know? And that evolution from just a machine to the message of, oh, I'm, I'm an object to be desired was um, really interesting to me. Um, and then that, of course, led to the iPhone, which 
in and of itself is, it's just basically a, a 2001 monolith, right? It's, you know, um, it's beautiful form. It incorporates the golden rectangle. It's a black object that doesn't by itself have that much, you know, it's, it's not fancy like the princess telephone. But the thing that is the most interesting about the, the iPhone that I found was that by incorporating your photos, it becomes integral to you as a person, that now it, it, it holds your memories. It's more than just a machine at that point. You're holding it in your hands, it's in your pocket, it is tied to you personally. So there's that emotional connection with memory that is, that is sort of at the core of why the iPhone works as well as it does. And obviously that's the user interface and, and you know, the, the design component of it. Um, I also was in, the, you know, the, the book's divided into multiple chapters and different, different um, um, ideas. So the, another idea I kept thinking about was efficiency. And we take for granted this idea that efficiency is, is good, right? Like, yes, that's something we value. You didn't necessarily value efficiency in 18th century France, right? You might have valued ornate Baroque clocks and wealth and gilding and the, the fact that it took like, you know, five years to create something. But we as a culture, sort of post-industrial revolution and especially post-Bauhaus, we think efficiency is the way to go. And efficiency for, for us, is represented by showing the, how to use the minimal use of materials and effort to reach the solution. So hence why modernism works so well in terms of, of talking about efficiency. You're using the least possible materials, you're simplifying the message just to be as legible or as quickly understood as possible, um, and, and, find, and utilizing those forms that tend to be things like simple geometry, hardcore lines, um, you know, reduction of ornament, all of those things then communicate, I'm efficient. You know, so you have like the Marianne Brandt um, uh, tea infuser, which is a, half, a couple of half circles, and that's it. Now that's a huge departure from the fancy thingamajig teapot that everyone was giving at the same time to say the Billy Wilder chase um, by Charles and Ray Eames that was designed specifically to be very narrow so that when Billy Wilder would start to fall asleep on his afternoon nap, he would, he, an arm would drop off and it would wake him up. So he wouldn't be able to sleep too long. So these are like decisions that are made to promote that concept of like, we are efficient, we hold value. Like that is something that you as a, as a consumer or as a viewer are going to respect that you will not be asked to put too much effort into something. It will work seamlessly. And when something has to work seamlessly, you feel pleasure, right? Like it's the difference between getting one of those, you know, packages of like a flash drive where it's wrapped up in like 15 containers of plastic that you have to cut through with like shears um, versus something that's like an apple box you open up and it's this beautiful thing presented to you. You know, it's interesting. The book is called How Design Makes You Think, but you've just given a really cogent argument for why good design means you don't have to think. You don't have to think. You don't. Yeah, exactly. The less stress, the less decision making. It, but it's an interesting, like uh, the slippage between those two. I think is fascinating. Yeah, or and the fact that we we do this without even thinking about it. That's the thing that you know. I mean, I've been a proponent of modernism for thirty years, and I, just because I thought it was it made good sense, you know, and then you realize, oh, that's why because people appreciate they they get pleasure when something works efficiently. That feels good, um, and then you ascribe value to it. Oh, this this worked. I value it. If I don't, if I have trouble dealing with something, I'm not going to like it. It's going to make me upset, right? So I'm not. I'm going to reject it. Um, there were some chapters that were more difficult than others. Love was a tricky one. I mean, obviously, you can't just do a book on how design makes us think and feel and drop out love. Um, but the thing that was interesting about love was how we communicated as a culture, and. Um, you know, the, the, this idea that, you know, in the 19th century, the, the, the primary message was typically about the sublimation of lust, that, that it had nothing to do with the, the erotic, unless it was infused with the other. That somehow the erotic was acceptable if it, were, if it was not part of your culture. You know, if it was, you know, Tahitian women, that was acceptable. 
if it was you know a different class than yours that was acceptable but it could never be connected to this idea of romantic love um and and that sort of strange mix of um acceptance of the idea of romantic love and rejection of erotic love was really interesting and that the way that that designers then manage that what you can see you know in the 19th century is tends to be those incredibly well even in the 20th century you know like valentine's cards that are beyond sugary sweet and lacking of any kind of eroticism um because that would be inappropriate you know the the objects that in the end turned out to have the most connection were the ones that emotionally resonated with the audience to their direct experience. Um, so for example, um, and I, I, I should track down a slide of it, but there's a book cover for the D.H. Lawrence novel, The Fox, which is about a lesbian relationship. And that is an incredibly strong, and it spoke to a specific group in a very clear way, that it was like, this is your experience. So that, that, that idea of communicating love, it just doesn't fly to be like, oh, it's love, big, you know? It's like, that is where designers found the best way to approach it was to almost be surgical about the, the audience and who they were talking to. That it had to, res it had to relate to me personally as a viewer for me to accept it as this idea of actual love. Um, humor was, you know, obviously I love humor. It's, you know, it's, great fun. Um, and, you know, this, there's this quote by E.D. White that I, I'd known for years that I really loved, which was analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. Few people are interested until the frog dies a bit. Um, and it's sort of true. It's like you try to take apart humor and it's like, yeah, that really was no fun. Um, but why do we find something is funny? Like, why? Now, the good thing about humor is that it's a great tool for the designer because we're able to actually communicate complex ideas and sometimes dangerous ideas by, by setting it within this humorous base that the audience can, is comfortable, disarmed into entering. That, oh, that's okay, that's nice. So for example, this poster by uh, Mio Neo um, for a festival in Geneva, um, <clears throat> is the thing that's amazing about this is it's, it looks so fun. It's like pink. It's got a funny, happy face. It's got rounded, rounded letter forms. You know, so the, everything's nice and friendly. And in fact, even the the half tone dots, if you if you zoom in closely, are little little smiley faces. So you're getting this like very happy, fun little message, isn't it? But in reality, what this is talking about is voyeurism and selfies and you know this whole other language of of um, you know the ego driven desires. That's a complex issue. You know, if you'd hit that head on, it's people are gonna be like, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, a little creepy, you know. But by by sort of bathing it in this humorous aspect, people they they it's like they'll accept it and then you know dig into it a little deeper. And you know, some of the examples, <clears throat> you know, from um, you know, the the um you know, zips and flower, which is like happy and straightforward and is what it is. <clears throat> to one of my favorite pieces in the book, which is um, On God Sings, Graphic Design is My Passion poster. Why is it with, one of your favorite things in the book? Oh, I just love this poster. It's just like, what's not Wait, is this I a mean, California yeah, thing? Yeah. Is it the rainbow? Yeah. Is it the- Oh, color? it's cats with laser eyes. Come on, like, you know, you can't- And the typography, like, seriously? Yeah, like, you can look at you can look at all that modernist stuff and the- and the, the show. I know. You say, this and then you get like, so you get like Comic Sans, you get Hackney Gradients, you get cats with laser eyes, bad croppings. Um, okay. um, Emma, Emma Steinhobel loves this. Okay, if Emma loves it, then I'm just going to show She's my barometer. So, you know, we as designers look at it and it's breaking all the rules, right? We're like, no, that is wrong. Like you are not supposed to use any of those things ever. Putting them all together is sort of like a French pastry gone amok, you know, that is just more of more. But in reality, and, and you know, you think, oh, it's funny, it's cute. You know, I actually had this on my wall in my, in my office for a long time. But what it's really talking about is the commoditization of graphic design, the fact that it's now a DIY possibility for many people. Um, it's talking about the culture and language of memes and the changing language of memes, um, you know, as, as they evolve. And, um, and then our own, um, our, 
judgment of good design and what it is. So that's a lot of things to pack into a poster. And by putting it in this veneer, I mean, just the cat laser eyes is enough to like, be like people be like, I love it, I'll put, I'll put it in my wall, is such a great tool, you know? Like hitting someone head on, I found was, the audience would just reject it. You know, they're like, I don't, again, it's about pleasure and reward. Like, oh my God, that looks difficult. I'm not going near it, you know? But by, by cloaking it in this, this sort of, you know, veneer of humor, um, the audience is, is much more willing to sort of engage with it. I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll bug on God and ask him to send you one of those, Just I know you'll probably want to blow it up on your wall. Yeah, actually I would like to, I'd like, I'd like a tattoo actually <laughs> on my head. <laughs> um, another chapter was about intelligence. I mean, clearly we work with clients that one of their primary goals is often we'd like to look intelligent, not like we're complete nitwit, nitwits. And, you know, for, you know, if I'm running a corporation, I'm definitely going to want intelligence to be one of those things that people consider when they, um, when, you know, they look at, at my brand. And again, like the telephone, the television seemed like a really great example of of that message. So all of these televisions on the spread are old school tube televisions, right? They all operated with tubes and, you know, like electricity from the, um, the Predicta, which is like nice, happy, you know, like the round shapes for your home, everything's great, um, to the science fiction, -y, you know, Panasonic, you know, which is like Jetson's futuristic, you know, embracing of like, you know, this optimism um, and the um, remarkably hideous, bulky Mediterranean um, object that would sit in your living room and take up far more space than it had to as, as a, um, as an object that displayed wealth. So my friends come over, I feel pleasure because you see, I have the income to buy this thing. And it's a beautiful thing because it's got all of this Mediterranean stuff on it. You know, so these are again, veneers that are surrounding something to get to elicit a specific response. Um, uh, you know, and then to finally reach the, the Mario Bellini, Brian Vega television, the, the square one um, on the bottom which is just this gorgeous object. And it's, it's like this, that I, that I love, I love this because it's so clearly, when it's turned off, it's just a black cube. That's all it is, you know, a shiny black cube. When you turn it on, the light emits from it. All of the, the um, operational materials are put to the back. So nothing interrupts that cube from the front view. And, and that clearly was designed for, you know, I'm sophisticated. I have fine art in my home. I have beautiful things. You know, I have Italian furniture. That's the audience that's designed for. But it's the exact same machine as the Mediterranean thing. Um, but as designers, we have made those choices so that the audience would feel like, wow, that's, that's me. That speaks to me personally because I, I value high design. And that is, again, sort of one of those those tribal issues where it's like, yes, this is my tribe. We value this. My friends will come over and see I have good taste. I, I you know, ascribe to their values of what is appropriate or not. Um, you know, there's other chapters that have to do with elegance. And in this one, I really wanted to deconstruct why we think something is elegant. And that really boiled down to proportion. Like, you know, that, that we just take for granted that something like the Nelson Day bed, yeah, that's, that's beautiful, simple, clean, you know, take it apart. And it's, it's living on this very simple grid of golden rectangles. Did you make that determination that that proportion was uh, the kind of catalyst or the, the direct manifestation of elegance based on research? Did it come yeah. to you by looking at lots of images? Was it conversations you had with people? How did you come to that conclusion? I mean, it's a little of all of those. Um, I mean, a lot of it was research into what was considered elegant. You know, a Vincent and Seth porcelain um, vase from the 18th century was elegant, you know, to that culture. Um, whereas we look at, say, you know, a Michael Vanderbilt chair that's a perfect half circle, and we find that elegant. And again, that has to do with um, societal concepts. Like our society has told us, yes, simple forms, efficiency, these are things we value. So we're going to think that is elegant. Now, it wouldn't work if the proportions weren't flawless. 
You know, you could do some a, a lovely half circle thing and um, botch up the the proportions and it's just never going to hold together. So does that mean that that if you were looking at Regency furniture or you were looking at, I don't know, Biedermeyer furniture, that the, the nature of elegance, there's like an equation baked into this, that those proportions at that moment, when we were looking at the world through the lens of the Vienna Werkstatt or something that, that before modernism, we mm -hmm. might have equated elegance with a set of proportions, that that's actually the thing that connects it from generation to generation. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's that it's that so you're giving modern sense. examples, but it works across generations. It works across. Yeah, because you can see a, a, a Biedermeyer knockoff and it looks like hell and you don't know exactly why. Right. And then take it apart and you're going to realize there's a mathematical proportional system that is holding the things that we see as wow, that's gorgeous as as precise. And I think that has to do with our ability as human beings to um, group, you know, to, to be able to look at something and take it apart even if we're not aware of it at that moment, we're able to sort of see like, yes, that half and that half match, this side and this side match. Um, that's, that's one of those things that I think is really critical to this idea of elegance that, that because it's, it's, elegance had more to do with harmony than anything else. Like something had to feel harmonious and you feel harmony, not when everything is identical. Um, it's like a barbershop quartet, right? Like they sing in harmony, but they're not singing the same note. It's everything works together, but within the same proportional system. So if you're a young designer and you're looking at, I don't know, an Armin Hoffman poster, the, the Der Film poster, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's all this blank space. And so the alignment and the understanding of the medium against the message, against the form, against the composition, that's a very difficult thing to teach. You as an educator must use examples like this with your students. Is it just a function of spending the time and putting in the time and looking? Or did you come to a conclusion as, as a result of this book to look at proportion through some kind of mathematical lens that says it's the rule of threes or it's about the mm -hmm. golden section or it's about certain kinds of rules that we have to plug into our mind that then come out on the other end in terms of understanding style, function, elegance. Like, how do you teach that? I mean, I, you know, I mean, that was what I was taught and I don't remember time sort of before, I mean, maybe in high school, I didn't know that stuff, but certainly by my first year in school, um, that was, you know, we were being sort of hammered with Swiss grids, but I, that's the way we still do it. It's like how the, the basis of a good page is going to be the grid, right? And the grid, so? yeah, well, there's, that's a good question. I'm gonna have to think about that. I, mean, I, I think so. And I know we have other editorial designers on board today, like Barbara Glauber. I mean, I think it's an interesting thing that obviously in this moment when we're questioning everything and having different kinds of conversations, some people see the grid as a kind of fascist enterprise that locks us into some canon that we may no longer want to persist in believing is the only way to do something. At the same time, you're talking about logic. And I, I introduced this book and you by talking about what a logical mind you have, which doesn't mean that you work in a in a straitjacket, but I think there is something about the discipline of design and, and taking its component parts apart, putting them back together that really does have to do with an understanding of rigor. And that's what you're, that is what a grid is, but some might say it's a fascist kind of uh, conceit. I, that, I mean, I think that's interesting. I, I mean, I worked with a student a few years ago, um, Fazel Sayed, who did an amazing project based on grid structures um, from Islamic pattern that had nothing to do with Western culture, um, that our traditional like incunabula sort of like manuscript, you know, a right. couple of columns and eyebrow column grid, but grids that work from their way out as an Islamic pattern. But those okay. patterns are mathematically flawless also. That's your next book. Uh, well, it's Fazel's project. I can't really steal it. But I mean, this, this conversation. Yeah. That, that the thing that you and I are talking about, and I hope is of interest to others, because I'm like going in the weeds here, but I think it's actually really interesting how how so, this book talks so much to emotion and sentiment yeah. and feeling, and yet there is a role for discipline and rigor in all of those things, particularly when you're making a thing that is going to be repeated in operation, whether it's a chair or a book. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that is what we do as designers. I mean, and I understand there's, there's certainly been times when I've set up a grid on a project and then purposely ignored sections of it. You know, there's, um, you'll have to help me with this. I can't remember who exactly, did Joseph Neal or Hoffman say, um, or Brockman say the um, the purpose of a good a, a perfect grid is is like a spider web. It needs to be flawless and mathematically precise, but it doesn't work until something interrupts it. No, but I love that quote. 
Okay. I mean, well, I don't know. Maybe. Well, then I said it. How about that? <laughs> Plagiarism is alive and well here at Design Observer. Yes. Yeah. Continue. continue. Well, it's why, we're starting, it's why we're starting? Why we're starting a witness protection plan for designers? Go on. Right. Um, you know, it, the great thing to do is it, it did stuff for, for me. Like, okay, so I am I'm one of those people that I did not get the sports gene. Like, I just don't get the idea of sitting in a dark room and watching television, like in the middle of the day. And I could never quite understand it. And and digging into this and looking at sports graphics um, and branding, like why why is it why does it work? Like how is it set up this way? And and one of the things that that I really found interesting about the idea of sports and pride, you know, because pride as in good pride, not like evil pride, but um, you know, good pride had to do with my tribe won. I feel pride in that, right? Um, now, pride works, and it's really truly based on an evolutionary concept, which is um, pride and shame. The opposite of pride would be shame. So I'm living in a, in a community and I go out and I kill the lion that's eating the babies, right? I come back, my tribe's like, good, good job, dude. Like you killed the lion, that's great. Well, I do that a couple more times, I'm going to have elevated status. I'm going to have access to probably more resources and probably have a better chance to choose the mate that I want, um, sort of the way it works today, right? Um, now, if I go out and don't get to kill the lion, or I, I fall asleep on the job through a- So it explains why I'm single. I haven't killed any lions lately, but do go on. Don't <laughs> you really do need to get out there and start- Let me interrupt you. Start some feline killing. Um, this <laughs> metaphor is really interesting. We're going to dig into this a little bit. Please, please continue. So, so let's say, for example, though, the opposite of that would be I, I just fell asleep on a job while I was supposed to watch for the lion killing the babies and several babies get killed. Well, eventually my tribe is, they're going to reject me, right? Like, you're out. Forget it. Like, you've just totally, like, you, you really ruined it for us. Now, rejection, banishment in that situation is basically death, right? Like, you're, no, that's not going to work really well, like, you know, on the, on the savannah, you know, 200,000 years ago. So... So we still have that idea of pride and shame built into us that is surrounded with the idea of community. Like, does this, do I do something good for my community? I feel pride. I do something bad for my community. I feel shame. Um, which is why public speaking is one of those things that people are terrified of because of course you're standing in front of your community. You may succeed, but if you fail, there's that inherent sense of like, I may be banished. Like this is my, my chance for my, community to say, loser, goodbye. Um, and then this idea of sports graphics, which I know it's a totally roundabout way of doing it. You'll have to read the book, sorry. <laughs> That's, um, but um, the idea of sports would be that the, the reason sports work is because there will always be a winner and a loser, right? So, so my tribe won, and when my tribe wins, I associate myself with them. I am, yeah, we won right? When my tribe loses, they lost. They got it wrong this time. We reject that. And then the, the core of that is that there, the sports are so satisfying because there was always a winner and a loser, you know, as opposed to life. You know, in wars, there's not necessarily always a winner and a loser. The outcome- oh, you're, saying, you're saying that we're intrinsically drawn to a kind of binary opposition because it's it has a result, it has an outcome. It has an outcome Clear. as opposed to like, well, I don't know, we kind of lost, but you know, it's like, you know, no, it's you won or you lost, that's it. There's so there's no room no for ambiguity and ambiguity in design is not a desirable state because you don't know where you stand. You don't know where you stand and again, it causes stress, right? Decision-making, right. it's like, oh, I don't have, I'm not gonna feel pleasure with this. Whereas even if my tribe loses, that's the end of it. I know it, now I can move on to the next thing. It's an easy transition um, to manage some of those things. You could save people a lot of money in the design community in, in psychiatry fees by writing your next book about, you know, this sort of analytical view of the psyche and what we what we see. I'm just putting it out there. Thank you. I, you and I, well, you and I can write that together. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not equipped, but I'm learning a lot. This is Good. A <laughs> so this was a timeline that where you where you were able to assess a kind of trajectory around all of these arguments. Yeah, this was, well, this was a chapter about innovation and how do we talk about innovation? Like, how do we, what, first off, you know, um, innovation is not a new idea. It's been around, obviously, since, um, like, Neander, you know, Neanderthals were not good at innovation, 
right? They came up with tools and they just never changed for like 200,000 years. Um, human homo sapiens were able to do the same thing, but then communicate to the next generation. And then they made tools better. And then they made tools better, right? So that's part of our, our species and how we, you know, the success of our species. Um, so innovation is not brand. Now, now, you know, of course, today, you know, every, every tech company is like, we're innovative, right? Well, of course you're innovative. Like, who isn't, you know, like what we're like, oh, we're D, D innovative. We're going to, you know, um, and I love the idea of just the coffee table as an example of representations of innovation. Because again, the thing on the top does the same job as the thing on the bottom, right? And, but each step along the way, it was showing we can deal with, you know, um, simple materials, we can bend wood, we can create forms that relate to Japanese or Asian cultures. We can, you know, every step of the way, there was an, a technological innovation that allowed for the production of that thing. It's also a commentary on the economy, right? Yeah. Like, like that mirrored glass. There's a wonderful uh, book on the history of the mirror that I, I read when I was writing my book on the face about mirrored glass and when it became affordable during the war and it was ladies compacts and it was rear view mirrors. And they apparently did a display at Macy's in New York of, of a mirrored room. And so many people clamored in to see it that people were like getting in fist fights and hurting each wow. other. And it was this like, but it hadn't been actually commercially available up until then. So the idea that what things cost affects supply chain, affects supply and demand in terms of what scarcity is. And then there's this whole argument that design is actually out of reach. Like that gold table was probably really expensive. Yeah, they, yeah, I think that gold table was actually, it's Italian. It was probably like in some, you know, amazing house in Venice. I don't think, you know, someone in the local farm had that table. Um, and the same is true with all of these. There's, there's, I mean, the plinth on the bottom by Norm Architects is gorgeous, but I can't afford it. It's, you know, I love that thing. It's like a crazy sarcophagus. Um, but the simplicity of this simple black slab of marble is just, but it's a But I also love the fact that that's sort of like, well, we 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 assign value to that now. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine those Italians in 1720? They'd be like, are you fucking out of your mind? No, we don't want that big black slab. <laughs> like, no. So again, it's like, what does society tell us is good? You know, like, oh, we know, it's, yes, that is a good thing to have. You know, that is, that that will tell me things. Um, obviously, you know, I had to dig into the idea of anger. Like, <clears throat> how do we communicate anger? What is, what are the, what are the visual cues that we have to set up? Um, you know, that we are angry about something and, Interestingly, you know, of course, there's going to be those those techniques that are um, low resolution, and I don't mean or low fidelity, and not necessarily like like oh, it's just bad res images, but this idea of um, spontaneity, that that the the design the solution happened so quickly because there was a sense of urgency, that there was no time to do high refinement. So imagine if the event poster from the um, Kent State um, tragedy were beautifully designed in Swiss, right? It lacks all urgency at that point. But by by having this hand scroll type over this bad, you know, half tone image, we get the sense of like you must act now. There is no time to waste on this. You know, free Angela Davis now. This is critical. Like this is not. No one's gonna. We didn't have like three months, <clears throat> you know, to do <clears throat> a beautiful, you know, Caslon centered access um, solution for this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and even the, the student as political assassin or as potential assassin, um, which is, you know, this raw image of LBJ, you know, dropped on top of this image of the student. Um, the type on the bottom is, is one step away from typewriter type. Um, <clears throat> But that's, that an, is, that's an interesting comment, like the accessibility and the indigeneity of the form as commensurate with the message. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's really tricky territory. I just want to quickly mention a, a colleague of mine at Yale, someone who teaches with, with Barbara and me, did an assign, a poster assignment for her students a number of years ago. And it was three posters. And the last poster, it was organizations on campus. And the last was for some citywide thing. Now, I'm in New Haven where the town gown student versus public relationship is a thorny one. And the student had chosen for the third poster typewriter type, to your point. And mm -hmm. the conversation that ensued was, are you using that unfancy typeface because you think that people from the inner city don't have the sophistication to appreciate it? 
And it was mm -hmm. a really fascinating conversation about how a designer gauges the right mood and appetite and knowledge base and appropriateness of form to content. You could see why the student did it, but it was a really good counter argument, right? So the, and I've seen other examples of this kind of urgency you talk about. Another is at the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda, there's a huge collection of AIDS posters. So you've got mm -hmm. Glazer, you've got yeah. Paul Rand, you've got Dugald Sturmer, and then you've got AIDS posters designed by like people in, in, in towns in Africa that had no public services. And they're mm -hmm. much more powerful. And I remember yeah. getting into arguments with curators there about the fact about how we actually talk about this work, because in fact, the graphic designer that is Sean Adams or Barbara Glove or Jessica Helfand or any of us coming to this work might actually not make it better. Right. But well, then you also, I mean, right. that's an interesting point about motive. Like, like yeah. I, you know, I, I, I got in trouble for this, you know, 20 years ago, I'll get in trouble again for it. But after 9-11, um, there was, AJ had this like open call for posters, you know, about 9-11. And I disagreed with that concept because it seemed to me that it, at that point, it became more about self-promotion. It's than gratuitous. It, it, it was gratuitous. And, it, and, and I, you know, the argument was, well, no, people need to express themselves. I'm like, okay, I understand that. I get that. But at the same time, it just seems so wrong to make something and put it out there and somehow benefit from it like oh i'm a very good designer can't you tell it just bothered me yeah, and yeah. and it's sort of that that yeah i don't know it's, it's a it's a tricky line i know and you know but but the, i think you're, you're right to bring it up in anger and in that kent state poster and the angela davis poster which uh, you know, most designers would know that that space between that a and that v you could choke a horse with uh, right. other than that it's a really great poster right but the I cool thing right is like the, the, the reason it's like that, and I mean, obviously it's because probably someone like a non-designer printer probably did it, um, but even the student as potential assassin, you know, to put that in the time frame of the 19, late 1960s and, you know, early 1970s, that's a rejection of Madison Avenue advertising. That is I also what love, that I is. also love the fact that just in terms of book design, that both of those characters on the left-hand page are looking off the page. Right. Which <laughs> when you went to design school, like design 101 was you don't do that. And it's so- Never do that. It, you know, but it's wonderful. It creates this incredible tension on the page. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, but I did like, but I did like the idea. It was like Swiss Helvetica would have somehow in 1968 signified, "I am with the man. I am not part of the." An counter excellent culture. point. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and then the last chapter I did was about honesty. That like you know, honesty is obviously something again that all of our clients talk about all the time. Well, we're honest. We're authentic. Well, how do you express that? Like why? What are the what are the tools we use? You know, and you know you can't just obviously the shakers are sort of like the kings and queens of honesty, right? But you're pairing like, the shakers with with the Cyark poster. Who did the Cyark poster? Was that you? I did that. Yeah. Okay. So why is that honesty? So the idea of the shakers, which was obviously every a place for everything, everything in its place, simplicity of means, simplicity of form. Um, it was about function over anything else. No vanity. No vanity, yeah, loss of pride as an evil, as a sin. And and so the the Sired poster, or the, it's a it's a little book actually, was you know, in my mind the same thing. It's like it's Sired, period. Like I'm not like there's no extra extra stuff to it. It's red because it's simple, flat red, it gets your attention, and it's an easy identifiable identifiable color. Um, and then maybe the only um, piece of it that starts moving into, you know, like the design world of like, okay, I am a little bit more special is the, the letter space typography. But, but in reality, it's, it's not pretending to be anything. It's not, it's like, it's a book about SciArc building in Los Angeles, period. Like, I think also there's something really interesting about building, which is such a rectilinear mm -hmm. X, Y coordinate kind of thing. And you've chosen to use italic type. Yeah. And yet they're they're all the same, and there's this kind of there's this kind of leaning tower of Pisa thing. It's a really fascinating uh, exploration of the built form against the letter form. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, the shakers would um, like it too. Okay, um, and you know, and some of those are are some of the examples I found. You know, there's like, I mean, a photograph, you know, from NASA. That's about as honest as you get. Like, you know, if you're not a crazy conspiracy theory person, right? Like if you're like, yes, we actually did go to the moon. Um, that's, there's no, you know, whoever shot that, if it was Neil Armstrong or whoever it was, I doubt they were thinking like, I'm gonna make the most beautiful photograph ever. Like, you know, this is like, this is documentation. So honesty is really about documentation. Mm -hmm. Like it's about 
uh, el eliminating any excess form um, and really focusing on purely like this, this is, this is journalism, right? This is not, there is no precept of um, I'm gonna make beauty here. Um, but at the same time, it works when you have something like, I mean, Matthew Carter's, you know, Bell Centennial, which was designed for the telephone book. And specifically, you know, it, it has that wonky kind of look to it because telephone books, for those of you that are old enough to remember a telephone book, were printed on very bad paper and the type was very small. So the ink filled in. So, you know, Matt Carter had to like sort of, you know, let's fix this. So when the ink fills in, it, it actually looks legible. Um, and again, it's like, I don't care about the aesthetics. I'm just going to do something that works and, and will be legible. That is its only job. Mm -hmm. um, or Roy Coleman's book, The Angry Black South, which again, like the Sire cover, I think, is just to the point. You know, Roy Coleman did not say, I'm going to put some interesting metaphor on the cover here. No, The Angry Black South, <laughs> pure and simple. Like, that's it. Let's not, let's not, no, let's not beat around the bush on this one. Right. You know, like this is no more calls, an please. important story. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was, that's, I think that was the last, last page. So, I, so, so what's not in the book? What did you cut? Um, oh, I had so many other chapters that were, um, I, I, well, some of this stuff I actually did. I do love this project. I have to talk, talk about it. So, um, um, <laughs> this was, this was actually in, in, um, one of the chapters about humor, and this is a, um, <clears throat> a packaging designed by um, Guan Hao Pan um, in Taiwan. And this was for condom packaging. And I love the fact that um, he, he, he took the issue of condom packaging, which tends to be, as you know, for anyone that buys condoms there, they always have that sort of like, they're very macho, right? There's a lot of machine type with like rivets and stuff and like glossy, you know, foils and things. Um, but, but typically, you know, condoms are four sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large. Um, that's it. That's, that's your choice. As it turns out, according to condom companies, um, girth is the biggest issue, not length, because, um, the wrong girth creates slippage issues, which now, you know, wardrobe mal malfunction. That's the, you know, you don't want that to happen. Um, and men will notoriously overestimate the size that they need. So um, I love that- Let me to laugh, that, sorry. That Pam tackles this by coming up with this idea that the condoms are based on vegetable and fruit sizes. So that you can, anyone can hold it and say, oh, if you've held a carrot or whatever, you know that's the right size right? That's going to feel appropriate. Um, and they're also so disarming. They're so, like anyone can buy this. No one's going to be embarrassed, you know, like it's nice, simple packaging, clean, simple colors. Very funny, right? Like, like, oh, that's hilarious. You're buying that gigantic, you know, cucumber thing, whatever it is, or eggplant. I don't know. But, you know, that's the, I, it was, was just it real, great. Did, did, was it really introduced to market? I'm not sure. I, I, you know, these were the prototypes that he sent me. And I just thought they were like, like just a genius. So why wasn't this in the humor chapter? This is in the humor chapter. Oh, it is in the humor chapter. Okay, yeah. good. I'm yeah. glad. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. A, someone put on Twitter this morning um, a, 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 an ad at a CVS at a at a drugstore under the condom display, and it says comparison shop uh, Trojan six ninety five Huggies twenty two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> which is a brilliant marketing, like really, really like low rent, brilliant marketing plan. But that is great. I love that. Very, very clever. Got a lot of comments. So, yeah. um, so what, what was not in, in, did you, did, were there entire chapters on uh, nostalgia or on. There is a chapter um, on nostalgia. <laughs> there is a chapter. So, but but were, there is, entire, yeah. were there entire thematic groupings that you just had to jettison because you ran out of time or <clears> money? <throat> Some of them just start, I, I actually found out I had to fold some into others uh -huh. um, um, that they that it was just getting to be like, I think at 20 chapters at one point, I'm like, I got to wheel this down to 12 because, yeah. you know, like it, it, it's going to be like, you know, mini series if I, if I just keep going. So um, um, yeah. And, and so they just got pushed together. So there was a chat, there's a chapter on intelligence, you know, but then how then do we talk about, um, not intelligence got kind of put inside that. Is there a chapter um, on fear? 
Here's a chapter on fear. Um, the pleasure chapter kind of had to incorporate some of um, the erotic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if I had more room, I probably would have done one precisely just on erotic. I mean, I sort of, you know, incorporated um, Herb Gulbalan's Eros magazine in that mm -hmm. as a representation of um, this is a this is our kind of erotic, mm -hmm. which is like targeted to designers or, you know, sophisticated, as we call, you know, in, in my old world, we used to call them armchair creatives, like people that were like, they go to museums, they go to foreign films, they're like, they're not creative. Why, do, why don't we call them that anymore, Sean? I don't know. Everybody is one. Do. I just, I've been like, you know, I just go to my office. I don't do anything anymore. You know, so, um, but yeah, this was, this is, that, so that was the sort of audience that, that, you know, something like that worked for. Fantastic. Yeah. But it was, I mean, and so much of it was inspired by you and like, you know, you're, you know, you were working on your Facebook at the same time that, I mean, you know, your book about faces, not your endless work on Facebook. Um, yeah. I wanted to call it Facebook. My editor didn't like that. Thought there might be some confusion. No, the oh, but it's, well, that, such good SEO value. I mean, <laughs> you think I can't win. Another reason I need a witness protection plan. Um, no, the book before I, uh, uh, that was my book on design as a humanist discipline, and I also wrestled with what would be those sort of you know containers into which I could think about things like humility and uh, sadness and mm -hmm. melancholy, because design isn't just always shiny. It does wrestle with these much more complicated emotional kind of you know core attributes of what it means to be alive and i mm -hmm. think if we've learned anything in this last year we have to dig a little deeper and think about those things in a more robust way and what i love about this book there are many things i love about this book but one is that you didn't just limit yourself to graphic design and that you looked at the built world you looked at the physical world you looked at the way we approach so many different things um, using our eyes and how we digest ideas through the visual, but really through other kinds of conceptual metaphors, which I think you beautifully handled. No, Sean, we're you. coming up to the end of our time together. Um, I wanna thank you all for coming and, and spending uh, an hour with us. Um, and I loved seeing Sean's work. If you have no, suggestions for people who you'd like to, we, we, we had Barbara last time, Barbara Wave, everybody who missed you. Um, uh, we've had two book designers in a row, um, but we can certainly invite anybody that you all want. So please be in touch with us. You can reach me at jessica at designobserver.com. Betsy is going to wave goodbye in the corner uh, is our producer. She's Betsy at designobserver.com. We do these once a month and um, uh, we really hope to do them in person someday soon. So until then, stay safe, stay home and get vaccinated. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, everyone. Good seeing you guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. And Betsy's just posted the 20% um, the, uh, uh, discount if you missed it at the beginning. So buy Sean's book so that he can, uh, you know, afford, so to, let me write afford to live another day and write another book. Yeah. <laughs>